By the end of this episode, James Reese Europe, Harlem Hellfighter, Lieutenant, and Jazz Band Leader will have been murdered. Even though he emerged from the battlefields mostly unharmed, Europe met his end at the age of 38, mere months after the Great War ended. On his deathbed, he still hoped that he'd survive. Then he could continue, through his creative work, fighting for civil rights for his fellow Black Americans. Welcome to Showman's Land, entertainment for the U.S. war effort in World War I. In this episode, I'll describe the Harlem Hellfighters in the war, James Reese Europe's involvement in music culture, and some of the songs he and his band performed. I also explain how audiences regarded him, his triple role as soldier, performer, and civil rights activist, and finally, his legacy following his early death. Europe sadly left behind few personal records. Instead, I'll be referencing voices like fellow musician and Harlem Hellfighter Noble Sissel, as well as many journalists who reported on him. As a disclaimer, Many of the original quotations have been altered in order to remove problematic, offensive racial language so prevalent in the past. Now, allow me to start with a brief background of his life at the turn of the century. As a teenager in the late 1890s, James Reese Europe established himself in the up-and-coming New York jazz music scene. After seeing few spaces where Black musicians could succeed, Europe founded the Clef Club Orchestra in 1910, which consisted of over 200 musicians in Harlem. Growing ever popular among black and white audiences, the orchestra caught the attention of Vernon and Irene Castle. The Castles were a well-known white dancing couple who performed throughout the 1910s and influenced new dance styles that Americans adored. Europe became the Castles' band leader, which was surprising due to his race. After three years of working and touring with the dancing pair, Europe joined the 15th New York National Guard in 1916. He trained as an officer since he suspected American participation in the Great War was likely. When the U.S. joined the war in 1917, Colonel William Hayward approached Europe to organize a regimental band. In the Memoirs of Jim Europe, Friend and follower Noble Sissel claimed that he convinced Europe to organize a regimental band that would be the most talked of institution. Yet Sissel knew that Europe wanted to position himself as a soldier and was not interested in being a bandmaster. Clearly, it seemed that Europe wanted to build a reputation beyond his musician background and believed patriotic participation would advance his goals. He decided to become both the regiment's officer and the band leader. He was stationed in France with the rest of the 369th Infantry Band, who would soon be known as the infamous Harlem Hellfighters. Even while hesitating, Europe believed that he could benefit the war effort and his prestige at the same time, which strengthened American morale, patriotism, and Black participation. The 15th New York National Guard was formed in 1913 and became the 369th Infantry when the U.S. entered the war in 1917. The American military, as many other institutions, was segregated at the time. Military discrimination required standalone black units to be organized, yet were still commanded by mostly white officers. On U.S. soil, racists constantly assaulted 369th recruits. In a country that despised them, members of the 369th still demonstrated their loyalty, Abroad, the 369th proved their courage in battle, which earned them the nickname the Harlem Hellfighters. Many argue that the name originated from the German enemy, cursed with having to fight against the fierce unit. In fact, American newspapers invented the name in order to spread propaganda for the war effort. Most of the Harlem Hellfighters' combat wasn't part of the rest of the American Expeditionary Forces, since General John Pershing reassigned them to the French Army. Partially because the French needed reinforcements, the reassignment was also because many AEF units refused to fight with black soldiers. Welcoming the 369th to their ranks, the French Army treated black soldiers as equals. Due to several Hellfighters' fearless actions, the French awarded the first Americans the Croix de Guerre, equivalent to America's Medal of Honor. 
The 369th also spent 200 days in combat, a longer span than any other U.S. unit during the war. They fought in engagements at Champagne Marne, Meuse Argonne, Belleau Wood, and Chateau Thierry. Lieutenant Europe led a machine gun company while also leading the band. Even while participating in this impressive unit, doubters usually minimized Europe's efforts and constantly scrutinized his band. White journalists usually questioned Europe and his band's music since they thought jazz was a passing fad, like describing it as the slapstick comedy of music. Some journalists believed that Europe and his band were flexible to high and lowbrow tastes in order to feed nostalgia for classical works while also being trendsetters for modern jazz music. An especially harsh review compared Europe and his band's jazz covers of classical works to being smeared with the burnt cork of syncopation. Clearly, the band offended this white journalist who was unhappy with their lowbrow and minstrelizing style of classical works. Without a doubt, this journalist connected the music that the band played with traditional black musical culture. In the 19th and early 20th century, minstrel culture depicted black people through racist appearances and behaviors. Even when reporting Europe's death, some elitist white journalists still found fault with the supposed low-brow music he championed. Music of this kind does not menace serious music. Those who know any of the elements which make up a really fine musical work will never feel more than a passing curiosity about the other, a curiosity which a couple of numbers will effectually gratify. The best that can be said of it is that it is a moderately developed form of organized noise, which may appeal for a time to the ear, but to no other faculty of the human organization. Jazz music and the band itself disturbed white journalists, who recoiled at change and felt at ease with traditionally Western and white styles of music, a notion that's still seen today. Though white journalists were unaware of and questioned Europe and his band's merit, black journalists and audiences knew of and celebrated them. In the last two episodes of this podcast, journalists praised Chaplin and Janice, not just because they were talented, but because they were white. White journalists considered Europe and his music as non-American because blackness has often been marginalized and seen as other. Some journalists welcomed Europe and his band's new jazz music. One journalist praised them by saying, If Shakespeare had heard Jim Europe's jazz band, he would have gone home, dipped his quill in the blackest black ink he could find, and written, Jazz, you like it. Even though they suggested that the band's race was the black ink, the white journalists still believed that Europe and his band deserved the honor of being compared to Shakespeare. Another review glowingly stated that the band itself is faultless, precision and harmony stamped on every bit of music, not alone in jazz numbers, but in the highbrow collections as well. The band showed great ability. Not ignoring the fact that Europe was a black man, white journalists referred to his race before reviewing or promoting his band. One journalist stated that Europe and his band was composed of, quote, dusky jazz artists. Some journalists referenced Europe and his band's race positively, yet still touched on widespread racist ideas of what being black meant in America. Even though they believed Europe and his band played every genre well, these journalists looked past, downplayed, or accepted the racial stereotyping of jazz music because they believed that black culture appealed to all Americans. Before knowing the efforts of the 369th Infantry, the black press knew how impressive Europe and his band were, not only as soldiers and musicians, but as conductors of black talent. In addition to familiar jazz, minstrel, and classical works, Europe and his band wrote and or played songs that depicted the black soldier's experience. Journalists were often impressed with these original compositions. After criticizing Europe and his band, one review ended with a positive assessment of a song called On Patrol in No Man's Land. The song imitated 
The noises of shells and machine gun fire, which Sissel acts and sings with considerable vividness. Europe was inspired to write on patrol in no man's land after returning from the war-torn trenches. He recovered from wounds in a camp hospital where Sissel and another comrade visited him. Little did either of us realize at the time that we were listening to a song that had gone down in theatrical history as being a masterpiece of jazz description, of a soldier's experience in no man's land. The chorus lyrics highlighted the war atmosphere familiar to many soldiers. There's a men and bus are coming, look out, hear that roar, there's one more, and fast, but there's a very light, don't gasp for to find you all right. Don't start to bumming with those hand grenades. There's a machine gun, the holy space. Alert, gas, put on your mask. Adjust the correct playing and hurry up fast. Drop, there's a rocket for the bike barrage. Down, hug the ground, push the can, don't stand. Creep and crawl, follow me, that's all. What do you hear? Nothing near, don't fear, all clear. That's the life of a stroll when you take a patrol. Out in no man's land, ain't it grand? Out in no man's land. Almost a proto-rap song, On Patrol in No Man's Land drips with warfront imagery. The song also doesn't censor the realities soldiers often face on the front. The song, My Chocolate Soldier Sammy Boy, written by white songwriter Egbert Van Alston, depicted black soldiers having a grand parade in their honor. The chorus is from the point of view of a mammy. The lyrics show how proud she was of the black soldiers as a whole. These songs not only positively portrayed black soldiers, but also showed American audiences that jazz music was a worthy genre. Regardless of Europe and his band's blackness, audiences, black and white, loved them and their music. Some journalists reported how delighted black audiences felt when seeing Europe and his band perform. One white journalist noted that, Colored veterans occupied seats together in the theater and gave their comrades from over there an uproarious welcome. And well, they deserved it. The house last night was overflowing with every seat filled and many turned away. Historians credited the band for bringing jazz music to Europe, the continent, while they were stationed over there. French audiences received many of the band's performances during the war. But that meant that there were limited morale-boosting performances for the Allied militaries that needed it most. One white journalist reported, Colonel Hayward recognized the fact that his band was too damned popular and made requests that the band be returned to the regiment. The 369th was doing more than its share of fighting, and the jazz music was absolutely necessary to aid in the rest camps. In the memoirs of Jim Europe, Sissel described how indifferent Europe felt about any disapproval or praise he received, even though he consciously wanted black musical culture integrated into American taste. As Sissel noted, Europe's modesty kept him from talking freely about what caused him to gain his personal triumphs and successes. Though clearly audiences appreciated the music Europe and his band played, white journalists seldom promoted Europe and his band on account of their race. At the same time, black journalists endorsed Europe and his band as much as possible since their story was one to praise for the black community. While the band's music tended to be lively, audiences could only participate in a viewer capacity. Journalists often reported that audiences cheered excitedly for Europe and his band, One white journalist stated that The only drawback to the concerts given by this famous band is the fact that one cannot carry their own dance floor with them, for one is needed badly by the major part of the audiences that throng to hear the jazz concerts. Another report similarly stated that Those in the audience just long to grab somebody and start dancing. 
All that was needed to clear the seats and start dancing was for someone to start and there would have been many helping hands. Even though they often sat still while listening, audiences badly wanted to dance along to the band's upbeat jazz numbers. Obviously, many white journalists also negatively wrote about Europe and its band on account of their race. One report stated that the small audience turnout at one concert was due to white people refusing to listen to jazz. That same article added that black listeners filled the balcony in the theater. A well-known journalist, Irvin S. Cobb, saw Europe and the band perform on the war front in France. Sissel, as both a Harlem Hellfighter and the lead singer of the band, said that most of the black soldiers didn't welcome Cobb since they knew that he hated black people. Sissel daringly included Cobb's full review of the band in the memoirs of Jim Europe. Cobb stated that, Surely this must be the best regimental band in our army. Certainly it is the best one I have heard in France during this war. But Cobb also stated that he had the self-awareness to assert that he was a Southerner with all of the Southerners inherited and acquired prejudices touching on the race question. He finally added that, based on black soldiers patriotically supporting the war, the spelling of the N-word would merely be another way of spelling the word American. Cobb and other journalists reluctantly reported on Europe and his band, but still couldn't look past their race. In turn, these racist journalists shaped public opinion of Europe and his band as examples of their race rather than as modern jazz musicians. Meanwhile, Europe always tried improving the circumstances of his race. In 1916, Europe revealed his lifelong dream to Sissel. I would like to see such an organization of trained Negro musicians specialized in renditions of Negro music written by Negro composers, but nothing but an aggregation of skilled Negro musicians can do it. Repeating his vision to the Associated Black Press, Europe said that our efforts as black musicians will be more and more appreciated as time goes on. People who never before had any serious opinion concerning us have awakened to realize that we are human, as all others. His efforts didn't go unnoticed by outsiders either. Addie Hunton, a black YWCA worker and civil rights activist stationed in France, saw the band perform during the war. She noted that, Aside from the band, there were just two black Americans present, which were herself and another YWCA worker. She saw how instrumental Europe and his band were in improving attitudes of black culture. She also added that they were positive role models for their race. While touring the US, the band's main mission was to fight racial prejudice. One black journalist wrote that one of Europe's dominant traits was pride of race which he showed by dignifying blackness and black music in American society. Europe often thought about what being black meant to his role as a musician and as an authority of black culture. As a result, black journalists and general audiences saw how dedicated Europe was as a role model in the black community and in music. Unlike many entertainers at the time, Europe served in the military during the war. While widely judged as a jazz musician and bandleader, Europe truly wanted to be known as a dutiful and patriotic soldier. When one white journalist asked him about the band, Europe, annoyed, responded, That's all I've been getting over since I got back. And it makes me tired. People think that all this band did was play morning, noon, and night. But we fought, too. This band had six men killed. And myself, I was gassed. Europe identified and wanted others to recognize him as both a band leader and as a brave soldier in the war. When conducting his band, Europe often wore his military uniform to show that he was both an officer and the band leader. Europe's own commander, Colonel Hayward, noted that others will write of his musical ability, of his uniform good nature, of his sparkling wit and humor. But I will say that he was a brave soldier, a loyal friend, and an honorable man. 
Hayward believed that Europe deserved to be known as a patriotic and inspiring American soldier with his more recognized role as a musician. Through his patriotic service for the war effort, Europe showed that he was a soldier and an artist who worked to make black Americans equal in society and in culture. Europe thought about his legacy constantly, but he never lived to see what people would remember him and early jazz music for. One of the 369th Infantry Band's drummers, Herbert Wright, murdered Europe in May 1919. Backstage at one concert in Boston, Wright stabbed Europe over a petty disagreement that should have never escalated. The disagreement? Wright felt that Europe had been bossing him around too much, even though Europe was his band leader and lieutenant. Sissel detailed the murder in the memoirs of Jim Europe after witnessing it firsthand. Yet Sissel also quoted Europe on his deathbed, stating that he didn't want Wright imprisoned. For he's a good boy. Just got a little excited tonight. I'll get along all right. Herbert didn't mean to do it. Just hot-headed. I'll get well. Europe's final words, according to Sissel, show how forgiving and kind he was. But also, Europe didn't want his murder to ruin or upstage his legacy. After his death in May 1919, Europe's family decided to bury him in Arlington National Cemetery in his band costume rather than his military uniform. In a sacred space that segregated black and white bodies, Europe's family chose to incorporate both his musical and military identity. His family let him forever remain both a talented band leader and a distinguished officer. Several newspapers mentioned that the first all-black veterans post was organized and named in honor of Europe. Black veterans clearly wanted to keep Europe's name connected to the military and with black patriotism as a tribute to his legacy. Though he never completed his memoir of James Reese Europe, possibly because of struggling to move past his tragic conclusion, Sissel suggested that Europe's dream came true. Europe's legacy is shown in black culture throughout the 20th century and beyond, as many black musicians and artists organized bands, wrote and showcased black compositions, and transformed black music from Europe's early efforts. Sissel and U.B. Blake, another member of the band, were two of Europe's first pupils that carried on his legacy throughout the 1920s until their deaths in 1975 and 1983. In 1921, Sissel and Blake co-wrote and produced Shuffle Along, the first musical written and performed by black people. Shuffle Along's most familiar song is I'm Just Wild About Harry, which became the official song for President Harry Truman's 1948 re-election campaign. The song in turn is a cemented American standard and a link between black culture and patriotism. Sissel and Blake both mentored rising black talents while also advancing civil rights for black Americans. Their efforts continued Europe's work that came about before and during World War I. Blake even referred to Europe as the Martin Luther King of Music, a comparison in more ways than one since both were killed in their 30s and both used their reputations to advance black rights, but in different ways. Due to the mobilizing of all Americans in World War I, Europe was one of the first crossover hits between black and white audiences, but unfortunately had too short of a career to have enduring remembrance. Thanks for listening to the finale of Showman's Land, written, produced, and hosted by me, Sarah Beagleson. I'd like to thank Zachary Garner for lending his voice to James Reese Europe and Noble Sissel. I hope you enjoyed learning about Europe's experiences during World War I. Feel free to visit the show's website linked in the description to discover photographs, see episode transcripts and sources, and more. Until next time, as the Great War Song says, goodbye! All of no man's land is ours, Now I have come back home to you, honey true. Wedding bells in June, June, all will tell by the June, June, that victory is won, the war is over, the whole wide world is rich in clover, and hand in hand we'll go through life, dear. Just think how happy we will be, 
I mean we three, we'll pick the bungalow among the fragrant boughs, but I'll come back to you with the blooming flowers.